uh, I have the pleasure in introducing uh, Tony Joseph uh, to our audience. Uh, welcome, sir. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. We would like to congratulate you for this wonderful work that you have uh, brought out, uh, where your efforts are you know, very well recorded. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for the book, and thank you very much for allowing us time after this you know, long four-hour discussion that you had, uh, you know, the public discussion, and then allowing us you know, time for it. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. Sir. Thank you, thank you. I, I'm glad that you enjoyed the book, and uh, <laughs> hope you enjoyed the talk too. Yes, it was a wonderful talk as well. Uh, so, one of the first questions uh, that, uh, like anybody would ask you is, why this book? Uh, uh, and, uh, what 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 drives you to dwell in the past? The seed of it was always the Harappan civilization. Uh, I was always fascinated by the Harappan civilization ever since I heard about it. So I would. Uh, read up on it whenever uh, I could come across anything on it. And uh, so ancient history has always been a passion of India. And uh, so about six months ago when I had more time on my hands than usual, I decided to go into three questions about the Harappan civilization that had always eluded an answer. Uh, who were the Harappans? Where did they disappear? And why did it take more than a thousand years for civilization to come, come back again. So that's how I started on it. But when I started on it, then it became as, you know, ex kept expanding and expanding until you realize that you can't answer any of these questions unless you answer how did India's population form. Uh, so yeah, the answer to your question is that it started as a fascination with the Harappan civilization. But of course, as you're working on it, it became also very, very clear uh, that these are uh, now in the eye of the, uh, these are very critical and sensitive questions today. In many countries, these are, these are questions that only scientists discuss, but, uh, in the, uh, but that, that's not the case in India today. Uh, you do mention in your book that, you know, this was the right time to write the book. Yeah. Uh, as far as the science behind it is concerned, yes. it had brought out a lot of you know, things which were unknown, yeah. uh, like for past, maybe like you know, even before like two years back, yeah. which were unknown. Uh, how do you analyze the, you know, the political scenario that has ripened yeah. and it welcome this book? Uh, yeah, my book where it talks about the right time, it is talking about the, the fact that this is the only time that this could have been written. If this book could not have been done earlier because this is uh, as early as it could have been done because even two years ago, three years ago, we did not have as much information as we have today about formation of populations across the world, not just in India. Uh, so the answer to the question is, why could it have been, couldn't it have been done later? As I said, this, this is a book that I worked on for six years and uh, delaying it anymore would have made so, no sense. So this is, so what I'm trying to say is that the timing of the book has nothing to do with the political situation. But it is true that the book is highly relevant to the times that we live in. Because in the times that we live in, we are arguing and fighting about uh, prehistory. And this is because there is a new concept of nationalism that has now come to the fore. A new concept in the sense that it was not the dominant version of uh, na uh, nation, nationality or nationalism that was uh, uh, prevalent in India. But uh, it, this has now come to the fore, which is more exclusive than the inclusive nationalism of the independence movement that uh, saw people of every creed and every uh, religion and every race and every language going, joining together, coming, holding hands together to fight the British colonialism. That was inclusive, that didn't leave out anybody. The nationalism that is to the fore today is more uh, similar to the nationalism of the 1920s in Europe, where national, nationhood and nationality is defined more by the, uh, the race, the religion, the language of the majority community. Uh, and anyone who doesn't subscribe to that is deemed to be uh, not deserving of a full citizenship. Uh, and it is because of this uh, definition of, uh, of we, are, we are now in a contesting what is the definition of nationality and nationhood. That's why history is contentious. Uh, that's why we fight over whether 
Aryans came into India or did they go from India to abroad? In most countries where there are settled notions of nationhood uh, or where there are inclusive ideas of nationhood, these are matters that scientists fight about. Politicians don't care about it. People don't care about it other than people who are deeply interested in history. So uh, we are in a peculiar situation. And uh, the world is also in a, getting into a peculiar situation. We uh, are our nationhood yeah. defined. Um, yeah, goal worker. Yeah. Uh, saying that, and after all, what authority is there to prove our immigrant nature? Yeah. The shady testimony of Western scholars. Yeah. So this was something that in RSS had very strongly propounded from early times, and to just uh, just to show that you know the stand has not changed. I would give you a recent statement by uh, the respected Amit Shah uh, in April 2019, uh, where he said, "We will ensure the implementation of NRC in the entire country. We will remove every single infiltrator from this country, except Buddha, Hindus, and Sikh." Now. <laughs> Have you thought about the political implications of the book? It must also be realized that, uh, the, that the man who conceived the idea of Hindutva, that is, that is uh, Savarkar, had no problem with Aryan invasion. If you read his book, it begins with the Aryan invasion. And uh, I wish I had the book then used use the actual words that he used. And it does talk about uh, the conquest and uh, so the right wing problem with uh, the idea of Aryan invasion uh, is something that takes its origin from the concern about the one man one vote uh, system not in principle because when there is a one man one vote system in place it's not uh, the Aryan invasion or whatever theory that uh, uh, is something that will put the hackles up of the majority. But when you don't have that, when you don't have that fear, Aryan invasion is not a thing to be feared about or opposed. So that's the lesson that I would take from it. It is uh, the opposition to the idea is uh, arises from the uh, from the necessities of electoral politics. But having said that, and it is not just Savarka who did not have a problem with uh, 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 the idea of Aryan migration or Aryan invasion. Uh, there are others in the right wing who did not have any problem with it either. Now, irrespective of what they think about, the question is what the facts say. And the, what it is clear, as my book says very clearly, is that uh, there was a migration from the steppe that brought Indo-European language speaking people to India between, the, uh, between 2000 BCE and 1000 BCE. Uh, I don't think it is, uh, until we have archaeological evidence, it won't be correct to use the term Aryan invasion. Uh, the correct term to use would be Aryan migration, unless we have uh, evidence otherwise that suggests. But the evidence for Aryan migration Aryan migration or migration from the steppe is, uh, is pretty strong and is based on ancient DNA. And uh, the political opposition to it, I believe, will have to uh, uh, go away at some point because you cannot fight facts for too long. Uh, and the facts are accumulating over time. So I think the, they will have to come up with a better uh, with a vision that incorporates uh, the, the, the idea that uh, there was some migration from the steppe that brought into European languages. And uh, I, I myself, in, in my book, I talk about it. There's nothing, speci nothing special about India in this case. All large populations in the world have been formed by multiple mass migrations, whether you're talking about the Europeans, the Americans, the Chinese, the Japanese, no matter who. All, all major populations in the world have been formed by multiple uh, mass migrations. That's, an, that's, not a, uh, that's not an exceptional circumstance. In fact, the exceptional circumstance would be any major population that was not affected by major migrations. So anybody who claims that we, you know, we did not have major migrations, the onus is on him to actually prove why you buck the, <laughs> what's the norm across the, across the world uh, in this case.
റൈറ്റ് വിങ് പൊളിറ്റിക്സിൽ തന്നെ സവർക്രിസ്റ്റുകളും കൂടുതൽ റിലീജിയസ് ഫണ്ടമെൻ്റലിസ്റ്റുകളും തമ്മിലൊരു ഡിവൈഡ് അതിനകത്ത് തുടങ്ങും എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് അത് സാറിൻ്റെ ഒബ്സർവേഷനിൽ എങ്ങനെയാണ് അത് ഇതിനെ ബാധിക്കുന്നത് ദാറ്റ്സ് എ കറക്റ്റ് ഒബ്സർവേഷൻ ടു ഇൻ ദ സെൻസ് ദാറ്റ് ദർ ഈസ് റൈറ്റ് വിങ് ദാറ്റ് ഈസ് നോട്ട് അപ്പോളജറ്റിക് ഈവൻ ടുഡേ ദർ ഈസ് നോട്ട് അപ്പോളജറ്റിക് അബൌട്ട് ഓർ ഡസൻ നെഗേറ്റ് ആൻഡ് ഇൻ മൈഗ്രേഷൻ ഇൻ ഫാക്ട് ഗോ ടു ദ എക്സ്റ്റെൻഡ് ഓഫ് സെയിങ് നൈഡിൻ ഇൻവേഷൻ ആൻഡ് ദർ ഈസ് ഓൾസോ and the uh, longer the majority who have a problem with uh, the idea that there was a migration into india the majority of the right wing opinion i think is that the aryan mi- uh, migration is uh, you know uh, is wrong and as always uh, as almost always the opposition is always based on uh, motivations of people who are who wrote this theory and they always go back to uh, you know 100 years ago he said this he said that <laughs> rather than dealing with the facts that are coming out today it's not it doesn't matter who said what 50 years ago or 60 years ago but it does matter what the facts are coming out today uh saying and there's a reluctance to deal with that for uh with that but i think it will be some only matter of time before that changes you cannot uh, fight facts for too long and the uh, book has been received very well by the academic uh, community and by the scientific community uh, and uh, the fact that it has been accepted well by the general public as well uh, shows that uh, it deals with an issue that people are really keen to have more information on is there a claim that you know the harappan population uh, where or the tamilians claim that you know they, they have the you know uh, they are the uh, harappans were their ancestors in that sense or uh, they have the lineage of the harappans when there are a lot of you know there is these puritan claims you know saying that you know we are the real owners of the you know the, the culture of india uh, do we have you know scope for any such arguments no the harappans are uh, as my book argues very clearly are the ancestors of both north indians and south indians uh, you could say that the linguistic heritage of the harappans res with the south indians today because of the uh basme book explains uh, the dravidian languages or a proto dravidian language was likely to have been the dominant language in the harappan civilization uh while the cultural heritage of the harappan civilization in, uh is lies with both the north indians and the south indians because the harappans moved both to north india and south india when their civilization collapsed around Uh, 1900 bce so there is no uh, scope for that there is also no scope uh today for saying that uh, purity or or or, or, a, or a, a singular notion of indian nationhood or civilization which suggests that uh, the the sanskritic vedic or arya uh, uh culture is the foundation of the indian civilization it is a very important constituent of the indian civilization but it is not the foundation it's not even it's not the only contrib- uh, found, uh, only uh, component of the indian civilization nor is it the earliest one the harappan civilization for example precedes it by far so we need to have a conception of our civilization as a multi source one not a single source one and this is this is very very important so there was a recent you know excavation in uh, tamil nadu you know, by sandeep popu and uh, you know others uh, which discovered lot of uh, you know, tools which were used by uh, we don't know who uh, i think to be precise we don't know who used it uh, maybe you know uh, some homo species uh, which has not been properly identified um, do you think that you know uh, this discovery from south india um, would me- would be a start of you know further you know uh, things because there has been not not very serious excavations for you know such things in south india compared to you know the north indian counterparts do you think that you know this might because they the authors themselves argue that this might change the timelines it might push the you know our understanding about uh, uh, migration and uh, uh, indian stage dispersal you know uh, further back yeah shanti purpose team has done excellent work in uh, in this in this area and uh, to the best of my understanding uh, this precedes the earliest 
our existing uh, based on our existing understanding the discovery of of the tools at the timelines that you mentioned precedes the earliest uh, 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 today's understanding of uh, modern human evolution uh, which is goes back to about 300,000 years ago so to me it looks fairly clear that the uh, tools found at Atrim Bakam, that uh, those, those are 385,000 years ago, uh, were made by uh, a cousin of ours, an evolutionary cousin of ours, a different Homo species. We do not know which Homo species uh, inhabited India uh, uh, at any time. So that's something that we like to await discovery. But uh, about it uh, changing the timeline of uh, uh, modern human. Uh, evolution or migrations, uh, one would need to wait and see if there is if there is more evidence of uh, of that that follows it. The report says that uh, the tools that were discovered uh, you know, were based on you know uh, levelized technique uh, from the Levant, and uh, this has been you know closely associated with you know uh, the Neanderthal Mosterian industry. Uh, uh, so uh, and we never uh, have any. In the studies which have reported uh, the presence of Neanderthals in any way in the subcontinent. So now this particular uh, thing uh, actually throws some light saying that you know, there was a, a, a human species, uh, a homo species, uh, which actually used levelized kind of technique to develop tools which was activated. Uh, so w what does this actually suggest? You know? The lines uh, of div uh, the, our understanding of what is the line that divides uh, and the Neanderthal stone tools from uh, uh, Homo erectus stone tools or from uh, modern human stone tools. These are all, I've been moving around in recent times. I've been changing and there has been. Uh, I don't think these have settled as yet uh, to, uh, to, a de to definitions that are commonly accepted. And it may not for some more time. So, but to make uh, I think we need to wait for an actual fossil to make uh, uh, make judgments on what lineage of Homo species we had. In the Indian situation, what I have said is that uh, is that both may have, may have happened. That there is a there is a group of the modern humans who stuck to the sub Himalayan ridge that went across, and there is another group that went down the eastern. Um, Western coast and then came up the eastern coast and went down Ada, which is the traditional coastal route migration. I don't think why one should rule out the other. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, we have not found and uh, tools there, we have not, as I said, we have not even found uh, fossils. That it shows anywhere near the time when the modern humans arrived here, even though we have found it from Sri Lanka. And uh, costly, I think there is also there might have been erosions. There have, might have been. It, it's 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 too early to come to that conclusion without. Uh, at this point of time, I think, especially when there is strong genetic reasoning for assuming that the migration was fast, and therefore. It followed a coastal route. We, have, we are yet to discover you know, a good fossil you know, records yeah. uh, from any period, yeah. for that matter, from India. Yeah. Uh, the, I think the only thing that we have is from the Namda Valley. That's right. uh, what do you think is, you know, what is the reason for this lacuna in the fossil records? Well, part of it is because of the uh, climate and uh, that everything degrades mm -hmm. uh, too fast for you to, uh, uh, for you to uh, discover. Second probably is also the fact that we are a heavily populated uh, mm -hmm. country and uh, that we have been in continuous, uh, in continuous habitation for most regions for a very long period of time. Uh, yeah, but uh, that's true, this, this is a problem and until we start, I think more intensive excavations might change that. So, talking about the ancestral South Indians, um, definitely as you pointed out, you know, uh, out of Africa migrants have been you know, everywhere. Apart from that, when the when the Aryan migration, as we understand it now, happened, uh, what kind of you know uh, uh, people did they meet in South India? Um, the question 
or I would like to reframe the question like, you know, was it a hunter gatherer tribe uh, or do you think that, you know, there was a farming, you know. Uh, that, that question to rephrase it is, when did farming begin in South India? We have a fairly clear idea of when that began. Around 3000 BC, or you start seeing uh, domestication of uh, millets and pulses. By around 2800, you can see that it's getting integrated with domesticated animals, cattle. Uh, so by around 2800 BCE, or uh, uh, in, the, in the following centuries, there is an agriculture that is spreading, a, a culture of agriculture that is spreading across uh, southern India. So that's the period of uh, of the uh, when the that the transition, the agricultural transition takes place in 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 South India. It's it's a lot behind northwestern India or the Mesopotamian civilizations in the sense that that happened around 7000 BCE or, or near about. And you are talking about many thousands of years later. But it is important that this, are, this is not a spread. It is the agriculture that is beginning in South India is, a, is an independent domestication of millets and pulses. So it's an agricultural center on its own right where farming started on its own uh, early and it got uh, and it spread so so the question is so the timing of the agriculture expansion expansion in south india is uh, uh, around the same time as the mature harappan civilization is happening in uh, northwestern india so any migrations that happened uh, after that happens after the agricultural transition is underway in southern india so, so to answer your question, when the idea migrated to India, South, Southern India was already transitioning to agriculture. Now, a Tamil cultural identity. South India cultural identity. migration, migration migration civilization. It need not. It, uh, it in fact, uh, the, the, what the book says is that uh, the Harappans are the common ancestors of both North Indians and South Indians. So it's not necessarily exacerbating the uh, differences. It's in fact reducing the differences. To the extent that language is concerned, yes, it does say that the uh, linguistic, linguistic heritage of Harappa uh, lies with uh, the South India, and uh, that, um, just as the linguistic, uh, you know, that we have four different language families is a is a fact of uh, life, and uh, and I don't think that should be a reason. That has not prevented us from having a common culture and a common civilization. Uh, the fact, the, as long as we do not force fit the diversity of the country into a uh, monochromatic, uh, monomaniacal structure, and as long as we are comfortable with diversity, that is a common civilization and that is common culture that is robust, that has sustained itself for thousands of years and shouldn't have any problem. It is when you try to force fit. Uh, a, uh, a monochromatic uh, culture yeah. that you have problems. That that is that doesn't suit the 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 genius of the Indian civilization, the reality of the Indian civilization, that uh, we have maintained unity within uh, with diversity. North India to Indian migration the Harappan civilization begins declining around 1900 BC. Begins. It's a slow process. Uh, the idea could have arrived in India. They, they were on the outskirts of the 
in this periphery in Bactria, etc., by 2100 C. So, it could happen in India any time after, let us say, 2000 or 1900 or 1800 in a significant manner. The best estimates of the, uh, this is not an, I mean, I mean, this is the, there are, there is no consensus on this, but I would imagine that the, the, the composed composition of the Vedas is a few centuries later, not immediately. If that is so, there is time for there to have been some, uh, what shall I say, mingling of cultures and languages before that. The, what should also realize is that, uh, is that scriptural or what is considered, concerned as, what is considered as sacred scripture is usually the last to incorporate changes, uh, which, which, which changes slowly. So, the actual changes and the actual extent of mingling and of the culture that, that would have been visible in the common culture would be higher than what is visible in the sacred uh, scripture. So, so that you also has to be uh, taken into account. And some of the sacred scripture, uh, scripture may, have, may not have been, uh, may have been of a very old nature too. But uh, these are things that we now have to relook at in the light of new chronologies that we have, uh, that genetics is suggesting. Roots can do canola, roots tiricharianola, but a trend to pangra viabomitud, uh, especially uh, Porta Julian, the migrant idler population, uh, so the children on the area. Identity yeah. and or in the Santa Randit. Uh, Palerim and uh, the whole DNA sequencing or a chay the trend. Why do you think in you know, a current? Now, I think you put, right, put it rightly that we have a lot of people who are uh, expatriates and expatriates are particularly uh, worried about identity issues and want to know where they come from. So, I think that is bang on. Even in the rest of the country, you will see that the NRIs are the ones most uh, uh, worried about, concerned about uh, issues of identity uh, and uh, to the extent that uh, they are deeply different in the in in, in the U.S., but uh, <laughs> deeply conservative when it comes to uh, come, comes to India. So, yeah, I think people want to know more about in a, in, a, in a, when when confronted with or in an alien land, the need for identity preservation is felt more. I think you've been very optimistic in the book when you stated that you know uh, the two streams called archaeology and population genetics which are two now yeah. uh, may not remain so uh, yeah. for long and you know uh, a time might ripen when you know a genetics archaeology might become a part of you know the population genetics yeah. uh, the more and more we extract ancient dna yes, the more and more you know information we get yeah. in the same way are you optimistic that this new understandings uh, would help us you know eradicate one of the greatest social evil that everyone has identified in india the caste system until the idea that marriages are happen because they are arranged and families are arranging them, as long as that's the case, I don't think it will go. As long as the idea that youngsters choose their uh, partners depending on whom they like and, and, uh, and that's a free choice, there's a greater chance, like it's a chance, not, uh, not a certainty, there's a chance that it will break down. But I did not see any suggestion uh, that uh, the idea of marriages conducted and arranged by families is about to break down. Uh, if anything, it is only entrenching itself even more. Uh, in which case, you don't. I don't think this is going to go away because at the heart of it, caste is about segregation by by marriage and mixing, and that's what leads to everything else. And unless you, unless you destroy that, unless that changes, that behavior changes, this will continue in some form or the other, uh, may not, may, in, in some form or the other. It may go underground, but it will survive. You have correctly pointed out that the current findings uh, in a 
clearly indicate that the caste is a political construct. Yeah. Uh, now, now you have evidence for this. It, definitely, yeah. everyone w- was saying that this is a political construct and it's related to power. Uh, rather than to what other right wings claim, but now we have a, you know an evidence to place. Yeah. You know. um, so again, the question is about it. Do you think that you know the uh, um, political stakeholder, political parties have you know taken this into consideration? Any of the political parties in India? Until castes learn to collaborate with those castes below them, how will the caste system go? It won't. Uh, will that go because there is more data? and uh, we know the real scene it will not go unless there is a, uh, unless there is a political organization to turn those data into lived facts into uh, into actual uh, opposition to the system but uh, uh, maybe the policies so uh, so yeah it will be corrected only in the political sphere ee pusthakathile sir science ne thanne sirikku depend cheyittundu വിവിധ സ്ട്രീമുകൾ ഇതിൻ്റെ തന്നെ ലിംഗ്വിസ്റ്റിക്സ് എല്ലാത്തിനെയും ഒരുപോലെ കൊണ്ടുവന്ന ജനറ്റിക്സ് ആർക്കിയോളജി എല്ലാം കൺവേർജ് ചെയ്തിട്ട് ഈ സാധനത്തിലേക്ക് എത്തിക്കുന്നുണ്ട് സോളിഡ് പ്രൂഫാണ് നോ ഡൗട്ട് പക്ഷെ ഇന്ത്യയിൽ ഇപ്പോൾ ഉപയോഗിച്ചുകൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്ന മിത്തുകളുടെ ഒരു റിസറക്ഷൻ ഉണ്ടല്ലോ ഓരോ മിത്തുകളെ കൗവ് ഇങ്ങനെ ഓരോന്നും എടുക്കുന്നുണ്ട് പശു എന്നൊക്കെ പറഞ്ഞെടുക്കുന്നു അതിൻ്റെ കോണ്ടക്സ്റ്റിലും ചില പഠനങ്ങളൊക്കെ ഉണ്ട് ഹോളി കൗ ദ മിത്ത ഹോളി കൗ എന്നുള്ള പുസ്തകങ്ങൾ പക്ഷെ എന്നിട്ടും കൗ ഇങ്ങനെ വീണ്ടും തിരിച്ചു വന്നിരിക്കുകയാണ് അപ്പം ഇതും അവർക്ക് വേണമെങ്കിൽ ജാതി തന്നെ വെച്ചുകൊണ്ട് മുമ്പോട്ട് പോകാൻ പറ്റുന്ന ഒരു അവസ്ഥയാണുള്ളത് പറ്റും ഇന്ന ഐ മീൻ വെൻ യു ആർ ആക്ച്വലി സീയിങ് ദാറ്റ് പീപ്പിൾ ആർ ആക്ച്വലി സ്പെൻഡിങ് മണി ടു ക്രിയേറ്റ് ഫേക്ക് ന്യൂസ് ഡേ ഇൻ ആൻഡ് ഡേ ഔട്ട് ആൻഡ് ഇറ്റ് സെൽസ് ഓൺ വാട്സാപ്പ് ആൻഡ് പീപ്പിൾ റീഡ് ഇറ്റ് ആൻഡ് ബിലീവ് ഇറ്റ് ബട്ട് ദ പോയിന്റ് ഈസ് വാട്ട് ഹെൽസ് ക്യാൻ യു ഡൂ ഫോർ ദോസ് ഹു വാണ്ട് ടു മേക്ക് ഷോർ ദാറ്റ് ആ സൊസൈറ്റി goes uh, or develops along the right path uh, we don't have any option but other than to depend on rationality reasoning and facts and say these are the facts sooner or later people will have to tire of lies and people will have to tire of uh, propaganda i would imagine this cause experience shows that uh, uh, propaganda doesn't win eternally that it, that it fails you've been working on this book for almost 6 years yeah. uh that's kind of a time a person takes to do a phd in this country that's right <laughs> so you have spent you know uh, in a fun more time on a work you might have also identified uh, some major gaps that need to be you know uh, rightly filled so that the story is complete yeah. uh, can you share some of uh, you know the uh, gaps that you have identified and, and, uh, and there may be new avenues as i said the caste itself uh, my book itself says that the beginning of caste is under under studied uh, in the light of the new genetic evidence we need to relook at what is the process that led to it and what changed before that and after that what is it that changed around 100 ce or or 300 ce whatever the number whatever the precise number is we do not have a good understanding of the process of arya migration in terms of uh, the period and uh, groups of people involved and i think even additional genetic studies will get, will put greater understanding uh, region wise in terms of how that happened which would put a far greater uh, bigger resolution to understanding what happened during that period the the spread of agriculture in uh, south india a lot has already been in recent times we have a far greater understanding of that but uh, i think there is still room for uh, for understanding the spread of agricultural package across south india in uh, in terms of sequence chronology and in in line with what's happening to the spread of the language the the earliest spread of the dravidian languages in south india so these are two three things that i can immediately think of we kaiyna oru vaartha vannirundathu rendu varshangalukku munbe pradhanamantri thanne oru committee history veendu onnu kuda parishodhikkan maatti ezhudan enna reethiyile oru committee vechu munshi ana inde idu yeah ennu parayu chairman chairman aayittu vechirikkunnu appo angane oru work oru vasham nadakkana 
അപ്പൊ അതിനെതിരെ ഒരു സോളിഡ് കൗണ്ടറിംഗ് ആണ് ഇത് ഇതൊരു പൊളിറ്റിക്കൽ ആയിട്ട് മാറുകയല്ല ഇത് ഈ പുസ്തകത്തിന്റെ ആ തരത്തിലുള്ള ഒരു the attempt of the book was to see where does it lead i did not know the answers i did not know the answers that the harappans would be common ancestors of north indians and south indians but that's what the results say um uh, i did not know that I, that uh, that the caste system did not originate with the arrival of the aryas that's new so that's but that's what the research says you don't go against what the research says research is what you depend on you can check whether does that research gel with that this research or that research in across multiple disciplines but you got to be ready to go where the uh, where the facts lead you and that's why in this book i must have spoken to more than 30 more than 30 experts uh, in various fields in six fields not only in india outside the world also in each case the most well known the most uh well regarded authorities in the field that's the respective of where in the ideological spectrum that they lay i spoke to every every uh leading academic and scientist in this country on all those areas irrespective of uh, where in the ideological spectrum they are and uh, the fascinating thing is that lots of scientists the the the, the people who have spoken well of the scientists and academics have spoken well of the magazine uh, is, uh, is 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 very long and there has been no uh, outstanding or a major criticism of the book from any scientific uh, or academic quarters the opposition has come from political quarters and on social media and uh, in a country where writers are threatened yeah uh, for writing fiction yeah. okay yeah. Uh, how safe do you feel in after writing this book if your job is to look at data and it has been for me uh, look at facts and as they are and report them which has been my job for three and a half decades <laughs> i can't change my job because it has become more difficult or become more sensitive and i think and i hope people will realize that the only way to deal with facts is to engage with them not to uh, try to hide them atrayam pain eduthittu harappan yeah history anushichu poi ini or pustakam ezhuthi nu parayunnu sir angane aanu parane okay idu ezhuthi kazhinje valare solid aayittu kore karyangale samshayam illada enna prove cheyada reethile cheyidu idinu oru vaadu implications undu അതിനെയൊന്ന് സമ്മറൈസ് ചെയ്തുകൊണ്ട് ഇപ്പൊ എഴുതി കഴിഞ്ഞപ്പോ ഈ റെസ്പോൺസ് എല്ലാം കിട്ടുമ്പോൾ is the fact that many indians consider tribals as someone far far vastly different from them now we know that that's not true those are our closest relatives they are us no matter where in the caste hierarchy that you are no matter what language you speak that you share such a large part of your uh, genetic ancestry with every other indian not just indians the south asian whenever i see use the word india in this book it applies to all of south asia so so not just indian we share it with all of south asia so these are new understandings and uh, it's too early to predict uh, how that will but i am reasonably certain that all of it is positive uh, all of it is positive and not negative because uh, you can see that many of the it's not a divisive message it's a message that says there is significant unity within diversity so it says that actually the unity in diversity was not an empty slogan it's it it has real meaning it sounds like empty slogan because we have been saying it too long but actually when you look at the factors that's the reality 